good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the very nice welcome, and thanks for the warm applause. So in this session of uh, big data and beyond, I'm probably before the big data. So I'm going to talk about small data. And I think it's important because um, we shouldn't lose sight in all of this big data because many problems, actually, we don't have the data or we have just small data or sparse data. And these are still very important and critical problems. And the question is, how can we address them? How can we solve them? And so that's what I'm going to talk uh, about today, small data and drug development. But let me give you a little bit about my own personal uh, background, because it will sort of reflect on my thinking and also what I'm doing today. So initially, I started as a mechanical engineer, very classical, airplane, cars. Here you see um, an example of my uh, PhD doing computer vision on three-dimensional flows in experimental setups. So you see on the corner the original setup and then uh, the, the measurement, the visualization of that in a virtual environment. However, after that uh, work, after this research, I wanted to switch gears, switch fields, broaden my view, my understanding, and I went to, to do research uh, at the Scripps Institute in La Jolla to study how cells move. Uh, and how this process, how this migration of cells is regulated. And again, using engineering approaches and using uh, computer vision, I was able to identify the molecular players, the signaling network on a nanoscale and a second time scale, how that is regulating this migra migratory process. Yet, after spending my time uh, in, in that field, I again switched and I joined the uh, drug development industry uh, to use engineering and mathematical systems approaches to support the development of drugs. I've been doing that for uh, almost a 10 years, uh, building up a, a group uh, to do that. Yet, uh, beginning uh, this year, I left to pursue sort of this vision of using computational approaches for drug development uh, and to build, build sort of my own entity and support uh, small biotechs and bigger uh, drug development, development organizations in that. So why, why big data to start with? And I think we have to realize that the problem of big data arises because it exists. And that is because of the new technologies we have, the IT technology and other new uh, ways they all produce large amount of data. And so we can look at that and ask, well, what is in there? You know, what kind of questions can we answer? And that is very characteristic for big data approaches. When you ask the question, typically the data is already available. So it goes hand in hand. But there are other very characteristic things which come with big data. Uh, one of them is actually that it comes in a, in, you know, in a big format, of course, but generally this is very homogeneous data, as shown by this matrix here. So all the elements are of equal type, and all the fields are filled, and it has a very nice and sort of regular shape. And that is because of how this data originates, because of the IT technology we are using, and this is typically the product. The other characteristic thing is um, how we analyze, how we study this data, and basically, that can be summarized and reduced by trying to uncover correlations between the different dimensions of the data. This can be very informative, but if we ask about the future, that can be very dangerous, because we know correlations is not causation. And at the end of the day, we want, we want to uncover causal relationships, because they bring or give the ability to tell, to, to predict what's going to happen in the future. Now, if we look at data in drug development, the image is a completely different one. To start with, data in drug development is very heterogeneous. It originates from blood samples, urine samples, imaging technology, 
we have, of, of course, the genetic testing, uh, gene expression. Uh, you can have exams, like neurological exams. You can have tests. And that creates a huge... It's, it's, it's an amount of data which is very different in its composition, size, and, and, and quality. Then data is often subjective. You know, it, at the end, uh, medical data also comes from asking the patients, how do you feel? How do you feel from, uh, on a scale to 0 to 10 today? Or the doctor gives an assessment, which is based on a subjective uh, evaluation of how the patient looks or performs. Then it comes from very different scales. Uh, it, it starts at the molecular scales and goes up to the organism. And an important characteristic is as well that the quality of this data is very different. It can be very high quality, but often the quality is very poor, as we have also heard, because you know, it's just forms which are filled out of people which don't have time to focus on filling out forms, and that reflects in the quality. So in the end, what, what we end up, actually, is not a nice full matrix of homogeneous data, but we have something which can be symbolized with sparse matrix, little data, very different data, or in many cases, there is no data. So of course, the approaches, the methodologies to deal with these problems is very different uh, compared to, to big data. And so uh, I want to give you here an example how that can be dealt with, how I'm dealing with it. And the example I want to give is on the development of biologics. Biologics are a very, is, is, a, is a special class of, of drugs. Uh, antibodies are part of this uh, drug class. And the characteristic thing of uh, biologics is that you need a biological system to produce them. You need a genetically modified cell which will then express and produce these drugs, which you can harvest and then uh, use as, as, a, as a treatment. Now, we are actually really good at genetically modifying cells to produce any type of biologic we want. Right? The problem, though, is is what, what is the right biologic? You know, from these design capabilities, we need to know what is the right type, what is the right design. And that can be shown here, the problem, in a way that, you know, how do you land on your target? Because the, the, these antibodies, they work by having these two arms you saw before. And these arms are very specific to a certain target in your body, a target which you suspect is causing the disease. And by binding this target, you inhibit the function of it, and you expect an improvement of, of the condition. Now, there are many ways you can do that. You can have the naked antibody, which just binds to the cell and destroys it, in this case, if it's a tumor cell. Well, you can also attach a toxin to the antibody. You can attach another protein to the antibody, which interacts with the immune system in order to trigger an attack on the cell. You can change the size of this uh, antibody, or you can connect it with other forms of drugs. There are many options, and technically, they are available to us. But what is the right one? A little bit more to, to you know, explain the difficulty in, in the problem. What you see here is the image of, of a mouse. Uh, this mouse was given one, one administration of, of an anti-cancer drug. And you can see the distribution of the drug within the living mouse by the green color. And very nicely, the drug also penetrates the tumor, and what it does there, it's killing the tumor cells. But you can well see that it distributes everywhere else uh, in the mouse, too. So that means you will have a lot of side effects this drug will not work because it will kill the tumor, but it will kill anything else as well. And that's a, it's a basic problem for many drugs, for a general problem in, the pharma, in, the, for, um, in, in pharmacology, to get the drug to the place where it should act, and not in other tissues because it will lead to side effects. So there are ideas, of course, how to get around that. 
And one way to do that is by using the properties of an antibody. So it has two arms. So you keep one arm, actually, to inhibit the disease target, the disease molecule. The other arm, you make it specific to a molecule which is specific to the tissue you're interested in. So it will bind to this molecule, and what you hope, actually, is that within the organism, actually, you move the distribution towards this tissue or, or the tumor, if you want, and improve the balance that, uh, between healthy tissue, where you don't want to go, and the, the disease tissue, where you want to move the target to. Now, conceptually, that's a very nice idea. The question is, how do you translate that? And the problem is, actually, that there is no black and white, so there is not a single tissue molecule which is only expressed in the disease tissue. Usually, you always have some expression in other areas of the body as well. And that you know, is shown here by, by this cell. So this cell expresses a receptor. Now, this expression and the kinetics of this uh, receptor, which is expressed, is, is different for, for all the different types of, of molecules and receptors. It's different in the number of receptors. It's different in the kinetics, so the way it's expressed and internalized. And then if you have your antibody, which is sort of shown on the side, you can also decide you know, how quickly should this antibody bind and how strongly should be the, the interaction. So you have to make a lot of choices on what target to choose and what interaction to choose. And the question is, you know, what is the right one to make it work? The way I approach this problem is uh, using systems pharmacology modeling. And what you see here on, on this slide, it's a conceptual view of such a model, where we, on one hand, are modeling the kinetics of the drug, the way it distributes in the body, and the way it's cleared. On the other side, we're looking at the target. What is the target kinetics? Where it's expressed, what's the expression rate, where it's distributing, how it's cleared. And of course, in between, we have the interaction, we have the binding. And all that is different for each of the different tissues in the body. And with this, you can sort of then see how different properties of different targets are influencing the distribution of, of your drug. Uh, some details now to how do you go about practically, because you need data to inform this model. And this is where we enter the, the world of little or no data. And because, because of that situation, because of this issue, we really need to go around and basically scrap whatever information we can get from the ground. Uh, you go into public databases, uh, you go into competitor data, patents, there might be some in-house data, maybe, in vitro data, animal experiments. But also, we are using mechanistic information or data. So we're using bi biology, we're using physics, chemistry, to put this model on laws which we know hold true. What you end up then is a, is a structure model. It's a set of ODE equations, uh, which are combined with a statistical model because one important feature of biology is the variability, the variability between cells, between animals, between patients, and that has to be included to be able to map the, 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 the reality. We then use a, a framework which is called uh, nonlinear mixed effects modeling, uh, together with a software developed with a, a new, new company, uh, which is able to handle this type of models. And once you built that, once you constructed that, you can run simulations and try to understand what is the best option, what is the best target, what is the best design for your drug. Now, of course, in the end, that's only a hypothesis. You don't know whether that is true. It's a prediction. So the next step you, you must do is actually use that information, use that prediction, and define experiments and define a development plan in order to validate that hypothesis and see whether that is the right track. Now, this has been uh, applied successfully in the past, and I want to uh, show that here on this example. Um, in, in this case, the question was also to, 
understand for a, for a given uh, uh, tissue what would be the right molecule in order to, to target this tissue preferentially. And there was a, a large set of uh, potential candidates to select from. And so using this modeling approach, we were quickly able to tell actually that most of them would not work. It would not bring any benefit constructing such a, a drug. And it was predicted that uh, there's actually only one of all these molecules which would work. And that was done actually before any data, any in-house data was available. And with that, we designed also the interaction between the target and the drug to have actually an optimal outcome. And what we got was what you see on, on, on the left side is a prediction of the concentration in the target organ. And again, the goal was to maintain a high concentration over a long time, and we were able to compare or, or show that against a competitor we would have a distinct benefit. And the nice thing is that that was several years ago, and this went through uh, the preclinical development program, and this drug will enter uh, human studies uh, probably next year, and we'll be able really to see whether this prediction, which was made quite a few years ago, will hold true. So what's, what's the next step? What's, wh what, what should be done? Uh, evidently, the, the issue of data is, 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 um, is an important one because that's, it's the fundament of, of building knowledge, of building information, the fundament of making decisions. Let's see how, how other, in other fields, uh, how it's dealt, how uh, data is dealt with. And I think this is a very good, again, example, because obviously McLaren does a very good job. So let's have a look um, how they are dealing with, with data. Their system is, is the engine, it's the, it's the racing car. That's what they like to optimize. That's what, where they want to get the best performance. So they take sensors, put sensors everywhere where they need to get the information. They have the data transmission. They do the data analysis. But also, on the other hand, on the other side, they have a model. And this model is producing simulations which can be compared against the data. And you can do two things with that. The first is you validate your model. You can update it if it doesn't reflect the, 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 the real engine. And you can use it to do simulation, to run scenarios in order to improve the performance of your car. So what you end up is with is you are having control over the system. You can control it, you can improve it. And the key thing really in that is it's a, it's a closed loop. And you can only get that if you have a closed loop. So you, it, you really need all of these components. You need them to, to talk with each other, and you need to have them established. If you break one place, the whole thing just doesn't work. Now, I think that's, that's a, it's a key problem if we, if we look how therapies work today. Um, in many cases, we have just an open chain. We have some of these elements, but usually it's not closed. And this is due to many reasons, but one, one of the main reasons is actually that in many cases, we just don't have the data. Yes, we can run uh, a genomic analysis, but for many diseases, it has been found actually that they have multivariate uh, cause of or origin. So you cannot just pin it to one genetic mutation. There is a whole set of factors which are driving it. And in order to understand the disease, you need to measure. You need to measure its progression. You need to understand the state. And today, with many diseases, actually, it's the expert, the doctor, who is giving you know, or writing a small note somewhere patient looks better today, or patient told me he feels better, and that note basically is all measurement which is done. And this goes together with very expensive drug development, so really there is no fit with each other there. So what is needed actually is using the technology we have available today in order to drive and push and improve the data acquisition to make data, to take it from the subjective level and make it objective so it can be used in, a, in, a, in, a, in the whole framework. So 
how can we, how can we get there? So the, the real problem, I think, is that if we want to establish the whole loop, we have to, or we, we realize that it's cutting across many different uh, scientific and expert fields. So there is medicine, there is the algorithmic component, there is uh, the IT, there is the data transmission, data handling. Um, so typically, these different fields are set up with different industrial uh, entities, they are separate. And as long as this is separate, this system won't come together and work together. So even though we have all these components, they exist already in some way, what we don't manage is to bring them together. And I think one important step to, to achieve that would uh, build or organize companies, departments, structures, where all these entities, these scientific fields, experts, can be brought together in a balanced way to think about how to realize these solutions and to make them real, to develop them, to bring them to the patients and to the society. So with that, I'd like to, to close my presentation, and I'd like to thank you for, for your attention.